Colorado is rich with secret history assessed through old maps, following routes that just are not followed anymore. Join us today as we discover an abandoned brick making facility, the first train stop on the Colorado and Southern as you enter the South Platte, and as we explore some of Roxborough's first residents. The first thing that I want to do is put this in its historical context. There was through time two railroads that went through the South Platte. This is what really put Roxborough on the map, if you think about it. It's easy access from Denver to here, and then opening up tourism as well as the West to mining through railroad expansion. So now we move from trails to railroads, so that way we can get some accessibility for both tourism and industry. However, in the 1890s, all of the landscape and the companies that own these railroads started to shift and shape because of a huge decline that happened in the economy. So before we get there, what happened first in 1872, founded by the governor, John Evans, a notorious figure here in Colorado, he founded Denver University. He also founded the town of Evanston in Illinois and Northwestern University. He was responsible for the Sand Creek Massacre, uh, which is a terrible blemish in history. And it was so bad that even John Evans got scorned for this. He got booted off of being governor of the state of Colorado, but he still remained a major force in shaping a lot of the Colorado area. So in 1872, John Evans purchased um, a portion of the Union Pacific Railway, and um, he wanted this to run independently. This line went bankrupt in 1889 and was reorganized under the new corporate name as the Denver, Leadville, and Gunnison Railway. When the Union Pacific went bankrupt ag again in there in 1893, so they were reorganizing in 1889, just couldn't work out. As many of you know, Union Pacific is still around today, so the reorganization worked, but this railroad was reorganized to the Colorado and Southern Railway. So you're going to hear me refer to the Denver, South Park and Pacific Railroad. You're going to hear me refer to the Colorado and Southern Railway. It's the same exact thing. So the company's main line was only as a three feet narrow gauge, and it started at Union Station in Denver up the valley from the South Platte River. And then it went to the town of South Platte, which we visited last week, then followed the North Fork of the South Platte through Buffalo Creek and Bailey. West of Bailey, which we're gonna explore in another video, that continued into the South Park region and followed what would be today's US 285. And it goes into some of the my favorite areas in Colorado, Buena Vista, Salida, all those collegiate peaks. So as you can imagine, this was a railroad that took people from Denver and allowed tourism into the major parts of that South Park area. Gosh, I wish there was still a railroad today because driving on 285 is a disaster uh, because you always get behind a semi truck and you can never go fast enough on that 285. So coming back, let's go to the history of this. In 1872, with only $2.5 million in capital, this, or this railroad was organized by John Evans. He then flowed in another $3.5 million of capital and construction from Denver to Morrison began in 1873, which was the first line of this railroad. Following approval by the Arapahoe County voters who passed a $300,000 bond issue, they went ahead and completed that portion of the railroad. The tracks then reached the mouth of the Platte Canyon on May 4th, 1878, 20 miles from Denver. So now we have this area easily accessible. The tracks reached Buffalo Creek on that June 17th. The following year on May 19th, 1879, the tracks reached to the summit of Kenosha Pass and on June 27th, they reached Como. Haley and I are going along this railroad and looking at all of these old summer resorts that are still there, as well as abandoned ghost villages, and there's so many of them. Today, we're really going to focus on the area that's closest to where we live in Roxborough Park, 
We're gonna talk about Silica, which is a mining town. We're going to go over to the Waterton Canyon to see where that original train station was that would have brought people from Denver to that South uh, Platte Canyon. And then we're also going to look at some of the residents in this area that had some ambitious plans to form some resorts as a result of that railroad coming in. There are some famous people that stayed in the Roxboro area as a result of this railroad coming in. And we're gonna talk about that. And at the very end of this video, I'm gonna juxtapose that with what's happening today in Roxboro and how that development and tourism is creating some controversial topics in the Roxboro community. All right, so we just went over the history of those railroads. Now let's talk about the Silica Brick Company, which was incorporated in Colorado in 1904 to manufacture lime silica bricks. And if you think about it, that's because that narrow gauge railroad came down here, which made industry something that was accessible because the silica manufacturing company needed to import limestone, needed to import coal for its manufacturing process, it was really important that that railroad was put in place first. This site included a feldspar quarry for the silica and a lime kiln for burning quicklime. And that's what we can see there today. Limestone and coal for the kiln were imported from nearby, commencing by rail in 1909, through that Colorado and Southern. And they actually built a silica branch on that railroad some four miles down from the Platte Canyon main line, which you can see on the entrance to Roxboro State Park, or you can see that into the entrance of Roxboro, the neighborhood. The Silica Brick Company shortly after failed, even though they advertised themselves as manufacturing better bricks than the, the clay oven bricks, they were stronger and they even said that they got better through time, I guess. Um, the silica bricks are easily identified because they're made, uh, they're white bricks, they almost look like marble. There's an S that's stamped on those bricks. They were, they were heated in this pressurized oven, which apparently made a very, very strong brick at the time. Like I was saying though, that silica brick company failed in 1912 and was reorganized as the silica brick and clay company which duly followed its, in its failure um, in 1916. So the, at that time, actually, there was a whole town around the manufacturing center. The town included a grocery store. Um, the town included a lot of different houses, and it also included a dance hall, so they liked to get down. It's reported that the biggest party ever at this dance hall was a whole 50 people, and they came for a birthday party. It sounds like quite the happening birthday party in the early 1900s. The property after it failed in 1916 was bought. Some of the mining started to exist, but the town turned to dust. No pun intended there, because it's a brick manufacturing company. And it was bought by the Helmer family in 1919. That's a name that's gonna come up in around Roxboro again and again. Uh, the Helmer family, my understanding, owned a lot of the land in front of the Dakota Ridge hog back, and then later bought some of the land behind it too from Purse, who we're going to talk about later in this video. Uh, the, Felmer, the Helmer family did operate the silica mine into the 1960s, and the Colorado and Southern continued to service the quarry up until 1941. Of course, then there was a Great Depression, and the silica branch was abandoned. While most of the factory buildings were removed over the years, the remains of the lime kiln still stand. It kind of looks like a um, one of the grain silos from a distance. But if you get a little bit closer to it, you can see that it has this oven. That was that pressurized oven that made those bricks. And fortunately, it was made a landmark by Douglas County in 2007. And the Roxboro, Roxboro Historical Society also remodeled this as well. There's some really cool work done uh, by someone that modeled this whole area um, through uh, just building train models, building models of the cars, building models of the town. It's a really, really cool study. It's by Jeff Young. I'll attach that article below as well. Uh, and that's where I'm getting a lot of the information here on silica. So if you're interested in more of it, make sure to check that article out. 
So the narrow gauge railroad did come into this town of Silica, which we can see here, really cool. And there was this big, big quarry, only the what you see right there remains of it today. You can see in some of these historical pictures, some of that iconic white brick that was made out of this as well. Some really, really cool stuff. And you can also see that it was a pretty happening place around here as well for a very limited amount of time. Classic Colorado. The next thing that we're going to talk about is an abandoned ghost town called Waterton or Kasler. I don't know. I've seen it both ways in different places, but both referring to the same town that's at the mouth of the South Platte River. And this is a town that wasn't formed on tourism, surprisingly, like so many of the other places that we visited along the South Platte. This was really the entrance of the Colorado and Southern. But despite that, what really ruled this area was water. Surprisingly, with a town like Waterton, you know, but a private company, which I didn't realize was a private company, Denver Water started here because Denver started to expand. And at that time, people were using wells or just going straight to the river for water, bathing water, water to like, you know, wash your clothes, water to wash your dishes. So in other words, that water started to stink and we needed to get a little bit better water. So um, someone by the name of Kassler started to really start to control the water around here. And if we look at historic maps, we don't have any of the reservoirs that we used to have. In fact, underneath Chatfield, there seems to have been some towns like Wheatland here, which I haven't been able to find anything about. And I guess Chatfield Reservoir just put that under water. And the railroad then traveled all the way to Waterton, which was a small community. My understanding is there was about eight cottages, a barn. Uh, there was also what seems like a schoolhouse that did up to eight different grades. So the town was happening and some of its remnants are still there right at the, the trailhead to the Waterton Canyon. So if you want to do an easy hike on the way outside of Denver, you can get a little bit of history and see one of Denver's ghost towns. And then you can look at Chatfield Reservoir and think, oh, there's probably some towns under there as well. Last but not least, we're going to talk about a local entrepreneur who inhabited what would have been or what is today Roxboro State Park. And his name was Henry S. Purse. He was one of the OG people, besides the Native Americans, of course, to live in this area. And if you go to Roxboro State Park today, you can still see his house and you can also start to see the business that he was trying to make in that area as well. Since the Colorado and Southern just came right up to you know the border of where Purse's place was, um, which is right at that silica that we talked about, he lived right behind that Dakota Ridge hogback, um, just in that same kind of area there. And Purse actually gets credit for naming Roxboro Park. I always thought Roxboro Park was named because of the rocks, uh, but actually it was named after where his estate was in County Galway, Ireland. In 1902, he and two other men formed the Roxboro Land Company which developed that area. And he also had a big, big vision for Roxboro. And it's very similar to a vision that has come into modernity now, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. So Purse had this idea. Oh my gosh, you know, what if we can build one of these resorts, like there were so many of on the South Platte, a little bit closer, and in scenic what was called Washington Park, because apparently one of the fountain red rock formations resembles George Washington's head. I guess you truly see what you look at when you look at those things like a Rorschach. So he thought what an amazing place to make a summertime retreat. And he did just that. He built his structure, which was his home that he lived in um, part time. And then he also built several other wood cottages. So my understanding is Purse had a guest book that showed a lot of these early 20th century visitors 
And like, you know, many people today, uh, there was a great appreciation for the beauty of Roxborough State Park. If you've never been there, it's a lot like Red Rocks Amphitheater, minus all the development, minus a lot of the people. So, uh, and I personally think that the Red Rock formations are just a little bit more stunning than Red Rocks, albeit different, um, not really set up in like an amphitheater style like those are, but the way that the Jagged Rocks just um, come out of the ground almost like a Triceratops is stunning. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, that's why we moved here, so that way we can hike here all of the time. So one of the guests wrote in this book, Edmund J. Churchill, a park made by nature's hand alone. The arts of man could only mar it. Robert Spear, who is a famous mayor in Denver, one of the big roads that runs through Denver, Spear Boulevard is named after him. He also developed Civic Center Park, so he left a really big mark on the city, visited here, and he thought that it should be owned by the city for the free use of the people, similar to the way Red Rocks is and Garden of the Gods is, which is all a part of that same Fountain Red Rock formation. Hearst did not get all the way into his business plan. I mean, he had plans to build a golf course, a huge hotel, probably similar to like the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, but he just never got the momentum. And then sadly, when he left his place in August 26 of 1918, he was struck by a tramway car that was crossing Milwaukee and 12th Avenue in downtown Denver. So he never got to build this hotel in Roxborough Park. And I think this is a great segue into a rezoning issue that's happening in Roxborough Park. There's a Nordic spa that wants to rezone a portion of Roxborough, the neighborhood that's really close and borders Roxborough State Park. It has all the same red rock formations. What they want to do is rezone it to be commercial so that way they can put in a Nordic spa. My understanding is Nordic spas are some of these new trendy things that have cold plunges and hot plunges and all that stuff. There's a lot of opposition to it in the neighborhood, however, so it's not going to get passed as easily as purses did, where there was no opposition, where it was just kind of come in, do whatever you want. Now, Roxborough Park is a neighborhood where I feel people are very much stewards of the land, and um, a lot of them do not want this Nordic spa to go in because it would create a lot of traffic in our neighborhood, which is heavily populated by a lot of wildlife, deer, turkey, mountain lions, etc., and would disrupt wildlife entirely. Roxborough, the neighborhood, has tried really hard to integrate itself with wildlife, although there are homes here, there's no fences, as to not disrupt any migration patterns. Of course, we're, you know, what we're worried about in this neighborhood is a 400 car parking lot means this place is gonna be big, there's gonna be a lot of people coming into it. Um, I've got a link to the Nordic Spa, and I also have a link to SaveOurRocks.com, which is the um, neighborhood that is trying to stand up against this rezoning in Douglas County. We would love to hear everybody's comments below on if they think it's a, a good idea to have this Nordic Spa, or if they think it's an absolutely terrible idea. I have my opinion. If you're liking our videos, subscribe to us. If you're thinking of moving to or from the Denver area, we'd love to help. Our website's symbiodenver.com.